computer only. You can type your questions and comments into the Q&A chat box at any time, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can at the end of the seminar. We will be also recording the seminar today. The recording and a PDF of the slides will be made available in a few days. The link is included in the chat box. Due to the heavy use of Adobe Connect, some of the slides may load slowly. Please be patient. Today's seminar is the Opportunity Imperatives by Craig McLean. Craig is known as Assistant Administrator for Oceanic and Atmospheric Research, responsible for overseeing, directing, and implementing NOAA's research enterprise. He serves as the U.S. representative to the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission and as the co-chair of the U.S. European Union Marine Working Group. He also serves as the NOAA Acting Chief Scientist providing direction for science and technology priority. He has a most distinguished career, which includes serving in uniform in NOAA's commission corps and attaining the rank of captain. Craig is also an attorney and has practiced marine resource law for NOAA. He has numerous awards and membership, both national and international. Thank you so much, Craig, for your actionable leadership and for presenting at the NOAA Environmental Leadership Seminars today. It's an, it is an, an honor. Craig? Hernan, thank you very much. And to all of the nice folks who have taken your time to join us today, I say thank you and welcome. The title of this talk is The Opportunity Imperative. And what this is reaching to is that in our environmental leadership of NOAA, we recognize that we have some remarkable opportunities. And those opportunities address an imperative that's on our country, our nation, and the globe. I introduce you to myself here visually, since I can't come across on the camera. And I just want to give you a little bit of a background about myself, that as Hernan has introduced me, the service career that I've had in NOAA for almost 25 years in what is one of the nation's seven uniform services, the NOAA Commission Corps, gave me a, a very, very solid foundation with great diversity throughout the NOAA mission enterprise. I served aboard hydrographic research ships, fisheries research ships, and general oceanographic ships. And I eventually commanded the, one of those ships in the fisheries fleet, which gave me great pride. As a young fellow growing up in New Jersey, and I'll show you an image of that shortly, I never anticipated that I would have the opportunity to rise to a level of engagement as I've been able to enjoy through NOAA. But through it all, it's not any one individual. It's a number of people. It's all the people that we have in our community. I remind you of this slide, which is a Native American proverb, that we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. This is a particularly impactful statement for me, as I find myself to be a grandparent now to a 4-year-old and a 10-year-old. And I realize that the world that they're headed for is going to be very different than the one that I grew up in which is very different than the one that my father grew up in. But it's our obligation to be looking out for the youngsters that are going to come behind us, both to teach them, to mentor them, but to do everything we possibly can in order to preserve this natural system that we live within so it is not so foreign to them that their ability to adapt to it would be beyond our reach. Here's a photograph of what I used to do before I joined the NOAA Commission Corps. And for those of you who might be scuba divers, I'm sure you would be absolutely thrilled with that water quality. For those of you who might frequent Route 95 when we're not under travel or movement restrictions, this is underneath the bridge of Route 95 that goes over the Delaware River or Delaware Bay. And um, it's actually quite a busy thoroughfare for maritime traffic. And I was working here before my NOAA experience in industrial diving. And frankly, I would say it's not for the faint of heart. It was a very open opportunity for me to learn skills that I never really anticipated that I would wind up having to deal with. And it was an opportunity for me to develop and practice leadership at an early point in my career. <coughs> what I found in, in this is that the experiences I had as a young guy at 10 years old, being given the keys to a, a small boat that we had on a river called the Passaic River. It was about as clean as the water you see me diving in here. And it left an impression upon me, much as I have brought that Native American proverb forward to you. The impression was that 
I couldn't swim in that river. The river was entirely too dirty and too polluted. In fact, that river became a Superfund site later in Growing up on a Superfund site really has an impact on one's outlook to the environment, whether it's the marine or terrestrial environment. So as I moved from a young, what I would describe as a river rat in New Jersey, onto the developmental side of a career, I attended Rutgers University. I graduated from Rutgers University with a degree in zoology. I eventually went on to law school. But I joined the NOAA Commission Corps, which gave me an opportunity to expand and experience something far more than the 10-year-old river rat ever to achieve. If I move um, moving forward here, this is a photograph that I made from the NOAA ship Albatross. And that is a photograph of the NOAA ship Delaware II. And we're in a storm on George's Bank. And we're conducting fish surveys in order to catch and count populations of those fish that are harvested for commercial purposes and also to get a good shot, a good image of what the ecosystem is offering up in these waters. I had a great many experiences here that I could recount for many times, many hours. But they gave me the formulative notion of leadership being the responsibility to do everything you can for your people. And when you have chosen the right people, the mission will come with ease. I do believe that. I try to practice that today with the people that I have the pleasure and the opportunity to lead. During the course of my career, I was involved in surface ships, also deep sea submersibles. And here's an image during one of the expeditions that I was sponsoring when I was the director of ocean exploration back in the early 2000s. I was able to start that program as the initial director of the program. That program has thrived today. And I'm very proud of the origins, but also the growth of how the NOAA Ocean Exploration Program has grown. Here, I'm inside of a deep sea submersible, which is kind of like outer space travel, only the view is a little bit different. And sometimes the remarkable revelations of shipwrecks like the Titanic are there to be seen right in front of you. I, I actually was on this dive, and we made these shots in a combination of submersible dives. But then there were also remotely operated vehicle trips that we made to the site. And this image was actually made with one of the remotely operated vehicles. But I consider myself remarkably lucky for the field and operational experiences that I've been able to have during my time with NOAA. As we look at where we are today, I tried to find an image. This was done by a chap named Eric McLean. And Eric is no relation to me, and perhaps if we go very far back. But this image really brings to mind the circumstance we find ourselves in here. And for the opportunity imperative in front of us, I ask the question, how will we deal with the recovery from the COVID situation that we find ourselves in now? This is one of the opportunities that we have in front of us, and that we have the chance to bring back an economy when it's ready, when we are medically secure to do so, but to bring back an economy that might be better than the one that we had to slow down in order to protect the people who live and thrive within that economy. As we look forward to a blue economy, we can be looking at a more sustainable, a more circular economy. And we could be taking the steps in order to engineer something that's better than what we had previously, which was a very consumable and disposable economy. We won't do that with the tossing of a knife switch. We'll have to engineer this carefully and purposefully. But I see this as one of the many opportunities that we have and that imperative for us to design and execute properly, to lead properly in order to find a path forward. Now, there are other opportunities that constitute the direction that we would head in here. And they really pertain to what NOAA's mission roots are. So let me start with those. As leadership is the ability and willingness to reconcile opportunity with competence, I invite your attention to the person who spoke these words. This is Admiral Thad Allen, who was the former commandant of the United States Coast Guard. The photo here is mine, but the quote is from Admiral Allen. As you embark upon engineering a direction of leadership, it's very important to reconcile both this opportunity that's in front of us and rebounding from COVID-19 as one with the competence of the people and the agency and the tools that are available at hand. And I want to take this moment to thank Jim Jenkins, who's a retired Coast Guard captain and is the chief of staff of our Oceans and Atmospheric Research Enterprise. And Jim gave me the idea and the opportunity to use this theme for the talk. So thank you to Jim. 
Well, the first question that we have to handle inside of NOAA that leads to these further opportunity imperatives is how many fish are on the sea? How many fish in the sea? We have to answer this question daily. And we have largely our National Marine Fishery Service of NOAA that's responsible for doing this work, assessing the fish populations, setting quotas, and regulating the human conduct that would allow a sustainable harvest of these fish. When we do, we're also considering and we're measuring the impact on the environment or the marine ecosystem. And we're also carefully monitoring the impact on protected species and endangered species, such as sea turtles and whales. The next question that we have to answer on a daily basis inside of NOAA is, what will the weather be tomorrow? And of course, it's the National Weather Service of NOAA that provides this information to us throughout the United States and other parts of the world free and available, and we produce this on a daily basis. And I have to say that it's the integrity of our National Weather Service forecasters that find them putting their personal commitments into the product of their work to the point that in severe weather, I've actually seen those forecasters put their personal cell phones in a warning in case anyone is not understanding the severity of some of the very dire warnings that these professionals have to offer in a forecast to us. Every day we benefit from the work of the National Weather Service. Next question then, what will the weather be like, not tomorrow, but 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years from now? Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, is climate. Very simply put, weather times time equals climate. And as we look forward to a climate future, we have to be assessing the various characteristics we measure today to see what elements of change are upon us, and then we model those. And as we model them, we generate forecasts of what the future may look like. This is very important if we start to undertake the notion of infrastructure building inside of the United States as a rebound from the COVID impact to the economy. We can't build for what we had yesterday and replace it. We have to be building for what the conditions are going to be tomorrow, because most of our construction in this nation and others lasts from 50 to 100 years in infrastructure. And just think of that, our highways, our rail lines, our electrical distribution enterprise, these last for a long time. We have to do this carefully. So then the last of the four questions that I would present to you as part of NOAA's mission is whether or not we're wise to build on shifting sands. Just the normal frequency and occurrence of severe weather as a coastal impact brings to mind the need for increased resilience in our coasts. But at the same time, we're recognizing in some cases greater severity and greater impact of those storms as they do occur. And it's important for us to understand each of these components in synchrony rather than any one of them alone. So those four questions, and I might even refer to them in an ecclesiastical sense as God-level questions. How many fish are in the sea? What's the weather going to be like tomorrow? What's the weather going to be like 100 or 1,000 years from now or 30 years from now? And is it wise to build on shifting sands? And as much as about 50% of America lives on or near the coast, this is a compelling question, literally, figuratively, and certainly economically. So that leaves us then to these three principal areas of our mission, weather, oceans, and climate. And I deliberately place oceans in the middle because the impact of oceans on both is apparent. The oceans drive our weather, and it is from the oceans that we can depict and anticipate what our climate will be in the future, in addition to sampling greenhouse gases, which we do as well. But the oceans are a very important role to all of this. And, and as I look to this lineage, I've also chosen, we have chosen to organize oceans and atmospheric research into these three portfolios as well. So from a leadership perspective, we are organizing our portfolios in order to meet those components that serve and address the entirety of the NOAA mission. So where are we with oceans, with weather, and with climate? If we look at these current earthly trends, you can see Throughout the scope here, the red arrows are indicating the direction of the trend. I think we all know that the Earth is warming. The Earth is warming to a point that has never been as CO2 concentration and also temperature where we've been since humans have been on planet Earth. If we look back to the very origin of Earth, Earth was a fireball. Of course, it was warmer then. But since humans have been on Earth, the trends that we see happening now are very concerning. We're losing Arctic sea ice. Ocean heat content is going up. Snow is diminishing. Glaciers are melting. 
The humidity is increasing globally. Each of these are global trends. But in particular, we usually focus on the lower right, which is the air temperature over land. But what you must consider is that by far the most heat, 90 plus percent of the heat, is being absorbed by the ocean. So in the very center, you can see the ocean heat content is being indicated here with this green arrow, if I can drag that. The ocean heat content is getting warmer as well. And we're starting to measure that with greater fidelity, including in the deep ocean water. So we do have a changing Earth. And that creates an imperative for us to address. And the tools and the capabilities and the equipment that we have inside of NOAA are tools that are available for us to do this. There's a growing confluence of priorities throughout the globe. And if anyone has attended or watched carefully the, the global gatherings that deal with ocean science, you can see the confluence of these themes. They are emerging quite in common. The need to establish marine protected areas. And of course, the United States has a marvelous network of marine protected areas in the National Marine Sanctuaries and our na underwater national parks as well, administered by the Park Service but also in the National Estuarine Research Reserves, which are part of NOAA's jurisdiction as well. Climate change is a compelling challenge that is global. Sustainable fisheries is something that every nation seeks to achieve. I think the United States, because of the excellent work of the National Marine Fisheries Service, has been moving in a very positive direction to get there. International, or excuse me, illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing, pollution, corals, etc. These common problems are readily recognized in all of the global gatherings on oceans. So now what are the opportunities for us? We understand the imperatives. The Earth is changing. We need to manage our ability to respond to that. So what are the opportunities for us? And here inside of NOAA, I really enjoy this graphic because it shows the complete breadth and depth of what NOAA does, from the satellites in the highest levels of the atmosphere to surveil planet Earth to the deepest parts of the ocean, and even looking at sunspots in order to give forecasts for impact to radio frequency waves and impacts on our power grid. We have a fleet of 16 ships, airplanes that penetrate hurricanes and give accurate measurements of hurricane development, and observing systems represented by this buoy and other undersea features that are autonomous, and also the divers that are in the sea. Inside of NOAA, we do it all. NOAA is a very well-equipped agency to be addressing these opportunities. So improving weather forecasts is one of the priorities that our current leadership team has brought into NOAA, and that leadership team being Neil Jacobs and Tim Gallaudet. And both of those gents came as an appointed officials from the current administration and brought in the priority, number one, of improving weather forecasts, and number two, enhancing the blue economy. To just touch on improving weather forecasts, we've done, I think, a rather admirable job of bringing in what is today the world's best weather model. That is the world's best weather model. And as we put different components into it and we, we provide the information to that model, it can perform marvelously. We have many other attributes here, including improvements to our hurricane forecasts, both in track, but now increasingly we're focusing on the intensity forecasts. And we have a new attribute, which many people have become familiar with over the past several years. It's an initiative that was brought in by Neil Jacobs. And it's the Earth Prediction Innovation Center, which really gives us an opportunity to bring unaffiliated academic or private interests in to work on our operational weather models and help us improve them. Then, of course, I, I need to mention ecosystem forecasting. Today, many ecosystem forecasts are singularly applied. A harmful algal bloom forecast, a fisheries forecast, or a coral forecast. What we're heading towards and making good progress on is having an integrated ecosystem forecast that includes all the attributes of the Earth, the ocean, the atmosphere, the ice caps, the cryosphere, and land base, everything that one could imagine in order to have a computer-generated Earth and to be able to give forecasts for what the behavior of our Earth and our ecosystem will be. Having that integration is key, because each of the components of the ecosystem influences the other. Projects like this, this is called Atomic. It was actually a campaign. It took about a decade to plan, get funded, and execute. It just concluded recently, but it was down off the eastern edges of the Caribbean, uh, actually in the Atlantic, but east of the Caribbean, off of Barbados. We had the NOAA ship Ronald H. Brown. We had NOAA aircraft, aircraft from European countries, and also autonomous craft working to collect 
measurements both in the air and in the sea, and, and working on the components that control the tropical convergence zone. And part of this deals with how hurricanes develop. It also deals with the effect of clouds on the atmosphere and on our weather. Weather, uh, excuse me, clouds are not just an artifact of the weather. Clouds can influence the weather. In terms of the blue economy, NOAA's imperative and ability to bring talent to the question of enabling a blue economy, perhaps building a blue economy different than the one that, that we have currently, provides us with opportunities in our priority areas of seafood production, tourism, ocean exploration, marine transportation, and going back to our earlier discussion about building on shifting sands, how we enable our communities to be coastally resilient. Exploring the ocean is another priority for us. As, a, as you can indicate or see from my earlier slides, it's one that's very important to me. It's also very important to the nation. And part of this, and part of everything that I've shown you here so far, as an opportunity to meet the, the, the imperative instilling that, that opportunity before us and fulfilling it, part of this is the strategy of leadership. How do we bring these subjects into the focus of the American people, of the Congress, and in order to get the permission to go forward with sufficient resources in order to make this work happen? That's another story, and I think I'll get to that near the end of this talk. But here in ocean exploration, there are many surprises in the ocean. There are so many surprises in the ocean that you would think you were in outer space. Here is an octopus that's also called the Dumbo octopus, because you can see the rather propelling lobes that come just above his eye. But in reality, this was a unique shot, because the tentacles of the octopus are withdrawn. And he's propelling himself really just with his, his lobes that are appearing just forward of his eyes. It's quite likely that this octopus does this all the time. But we see it so infrequently that this was a unique finding and a unique opportunity to observe a behavior that was really quite confusing to our, our folks that were making the observation. Here's a real gem. This is a giant squid. And for years, people have been looking in order to photograph or prove the existence of giant squid. And here, our colleague Edie Witter, who was funded by, in part, our NOAA resources from the Ocean Exploration Program. And Edie was able to capture an image of a giant squid. And if there's a Mount Everest summit for undersea exploration and marine life, it was this. So congratulations to Edie and her team. Here's a marvelous and beautiful creature of the sea. It's called a siphonophore. And the color rendition here is just absolutely magnificent. But in the normal deep undersea, it's only by bringing artificial light that you could see these creatures. Normally, everything is pitch black, completely dark, and under a great deal of pressure. Here's a new species of octopus that was several miles deep and came from a Pacific campaign that, that we ran. And this unique new species is something that we've been able to describe because we have high definition video. And we can bring that understanding back to people and scientists to study. But this one, I really admire. I'm not sure we really know what this is. And there's a, there's a poetic harmony to me in all of this that we don't know everything that's in the sea today. And if we did, then the job would be done. So I really like when our teams come back with a discovery like this particular specimen. We're not really sure what it is. And maybe one day we will be. But I kind of like the idea that we continue to search where there are unknowns. Now, speaking of unknowns, if I show you this image, it is a map, obviously, of the world. But in particular, it looks like the oceans have been drained. And you can see the undersea features in this piece. I assure you that most of these undersea features are artistically rendered rather than factually derived from highest resolution surveys. In fact, we don't have much in the way of high resolution surveys of the undersea portion of the Earth. The Earth's surface that is dry has been marvelously mapped, easily mapped. But the undersea, we have challenges with physics in getting measurement signals through the water in order to get the fidelity that we need. So one of the best examples I could show you is if you allow me to bring you to the northeast of the United States. This is an oblique view. And I'm going to show you where, as I move this green arrow, I'm going to show you that back here is where New Jersey is, where I grew up. Here's New York City right in here. This is Long Island, Connecticut. Moving on up into Massachusetts. That would be Martha's Vineyard. That would be Nantucket. This is Cape Cod moving out to the tip, which is Provincetown, on up into 
the rest of Massachusetts on into Maine, and then, of course, that would be Nova Scotia. So this feature, for those mariners among you, this is George's Bank, which is a remarkably rich fishing ground. But if I were to show you, as, as I'm attempting, to look at this area in here that's white, that's inshore area, and this area in here that's blue, extending down in here as well, you can see how rough the definition is and how imprecise those images are. And this is what our satellite-derived ocean mapping and our single beam, almost fish finder-like ocean mapping renders. And that's the majority of what the United States Exclusive Economic Zone has in terms of the fidelity of our measurements. Compare that, please, to what we see here in the green and with the highlights in red. This area in here has been insonified by the tool we call a multi-beam echo sounder. It's basically your fish finder times several score of transducers that map in you know, oblique directions, including directly under the ship, and they bring back a much higher resolution of the ocean bottom. It's only when we see these types of features, like these sea mounts, with this kind of fidelity, that we can really understand what the ecosystem has to offer, how stressed it might be, or where we could go and find in these areas of rapid change, for example, the bottom to the top of a seamount, or where there is no seamount. We see much more relief here. There's much more biological activity. It gives us a much stronger indication of how we can serve and map those additional missions that we have in order to do what we do for oceans, for climate, and for weather. The area in red that you see here throughout this map shows you those areas of the United States Exclusive Economic Zone that have not yet been mapped to the degree of high resolution that I was just showing you. So much of the Alaska area, including up in the North Slope area, much of the West Coast Exclusive Economic Zone, in and around here in the Atlantic, you can see we've done a fairly good job in the Atlantic side, but we have much to do in the Caribbean in the Hawaiian Islands, the main eight Hawaiian Islands, but also the Northwestern, and then throughout the Pacific territories. So this task was upon us. And once again, looking for the opportunity, the imperative, and finding the leadership in order to make that work, we've been telling this story for years. And we finally wound up with a current team, and I give Admiral Gallaudet the credit, and also a chap named Stu Levenbach and Kevin Wheeler, who were part of the, the appointed team, who really jumped into this, took it on board, and advocated for the importance of mapping our US exclusive economic zone so that we could really fulfill the ambition of an enhanced blue economy. And you see here that a presidential memorandum was established in November of 2019, giving us the instruction to go and get that job done. So we're ready to do that job. It is a tremendous opportunity for us. I'll talk about a few other opportunities that are in front of us. Partnerships are key in any organization and in any method of attaining huge and ambitious goals. No one single agency, no one single entity can get any of the things done that I'm talking about, whether it's understanding climate, whether it's advancing weather and weather forecasts, or whether it's in developing a renewed or enhanced blue economy. But the private, uh, public-private partnerships that we've been able to develop are quite profound and quite progressive. There's a federal organization that exists to just establish these types of agreements. And appearing on the lower left is the National Ocean Partnership Program, or NOP as it's called. But the National Ocean Partnership Program is designed to invite federal agencies and many other players to come together in order to work on science questions and solutions that could be funded by private sector, public sector, and engage academia as well in order to perform those, those activities. We have also, these, in the upper left, the Seabed 2030 project. Seabed 2030 is an ambitious project to not just map the US EEZ, but to be mapping the entire world's ocean by the year 2030. Remarkably ambitious. We're participating in that. And part of our contribution is to be mapping the US EEZ but we're also mapping parts of the world ocean. We have the Global Ocean Observing System, which is a system of satellites and floating gliders and drifters and, and floats themselves that the United States pays for about half of the world's capacity. We work that diligently. We have a project that we're sharing with the European Union to build an Atlantic observing system called Atlantos under the Global Ocean Observing System. 
and then the Tropical Pacific Observing System. Each of these involve many nations. Some of these involve private sector. They're marvelous contributions. But now talk about marvelous. I want to bring you over to these three, which are fantastic. Viking Cruise Lines, through the work of Debbie Lee, our director of the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, has developed a partnership with NOAA and the Viking Cruise Lines. Viking will be in the Great Lakes providing ship capacity not just to educate the people who are embarked and enjoy their cruises, but also to be able to give our scientists an opportunity to get out on the lakes and collect specimens and make measurements that we otherwise don't have access to. Here's a group called Ocean Infinity. They were remarkable in their performance in the search for the MH70 aircraft that crashed in the southern Indian Ocean west of Australia. The, the remains of that aircraft have still not been found, which points to, yet again, how little we know about the ocean. But Ocean Infinity uses surface craft to transmit navigation signal down to these submerged autonomous vehicles. And these fellows here are bigger than um, a Cadillac Escalade. So they're quite profound, quite robust, and they do a remarkable degree of surveying. And we have a partnership with Ocean Infinity. And then I'll move up here to Ocean X. But Ocean X is so unique that I'm just going to bring us to one more slide and show you the close-up of where they're headed. This is a new vessel that they have in preparation, the Aleutia II. And Ocean X is owned and operated by a gentleman named Mr. Ray Dalio. And Mr. Dalio has been a benefactor and uh, a sponsor of ocean science for some time. His heart is in it. His passion is in it. But he's also teamed up with other people with passion and with heart and additional skills to come in. And part of the Dalio family includes expert filmmakers. But they've also recruited the likes of James Cameron, the BBC, and the, the uh, Blue Ocean group um, of the Blue Planet group of BBC. So we're very excited about this partnership and each of the others because, once again, for the mission of exploring the ocean, we are force multiplying and collaborating with each other to fulfill each other's needs and ambitions, which ultimately add up to exploring and learning more about the ocean. We have international opportunities, too, to engage. And I find it remarkable here how the United States has led in each of these areas. I'm fortunate to be affiliated with each of these components here. But the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, very quickly, is a group of 150 countries that gather as governments and government scientists and non-government scientists to identify the priorities that we have in order to address ocean science for the betterment of humankind and to enable the types of developments we're talking about, about sustainable blue economy. From this has come the Global Ocean Observing System on the right, and also the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization. This is an enterprise that constitutes the weather services of every nation. And they meet routinely. My colleague, Louis Uccellini, is the United States representative to the World Meteorological Organization. I am the representative to the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. And I think between the two, we are doing some very, very fine work that is resulting in better weather forecasts for you and also better ocean forecasts for the world. I'll lastly mention the Marine Technology Society, which is a very important organization here in the United States and abroad. It's a professional society. And I just highlight that because there is a role, there's a very important role for professional societies in advancing one's own leadership in careers and also in advancing with objective advice how to implement what's important for humankind throughout, whether it's the atmosphere or whether it's the oceans. But the role of professional societies is very important and profound. I'll mention here something else that's occupying a good deal of my time. And for the opportunity imperative, what we know needs to get done, we know that the globe and the oceans within that are changing. What do we do about it in order to deliver a better future for those grandchildren whose future we are borrowing in what we do right now? So as we look at this, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, which I mentioned just the previous slide, has developed a UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. That UN Decade was proposed to the UN General Assembly. It was passed, implemented, and now the UN Decade is charged in the IOC stewardship to develop an implementation plan, which we're working on now. And I'm showing you across this top image right here of these four, excuse me, of these seven areas what the focus areas will likely be as we implement the UN decade. Now, I'm very delighted to be serving with several other Americans on a 20-person team. We only have 
uh, three, three or four Americans on that team, but Margaret Leinen, who's the director of Scripps Institute of Oceanography, is on there with me as well. And um, we also have our tsunami expert from the Caribbean, Krista von Hildebrandt, who's also on, on there. So we're working as Americans with Chinese, with India representatives, France, United Kingdom. We're, we have people from all over the globe that are working to plan this. I mentioned why we need to map the world's ocean. That is an objective. I mentioned ocean observing and the complexity of that scheme. That is an objective. In terms of working left to right, we need a better way to assess our marine ecosystems and working with genomics and environmental DNA. That is an objective to bring into play. Developing a data portal so that ocean data can be used much more readily. NOAA, through the National Centers for Environmental Information, as part of our, our uh, NOAA family, has worked diligently to be, for decades, the repository of atmospheric and oceanic information, not just for us, not just for the United States citizens, but for the world. They do a marvelous job. We're looking at an integrated multi-hazard warning system, which would move from tsunamis through tropical cyclones and hurricanes, working to build better integrated models for ocean prediction and atmospheric prediction, and then capacity development. So those communities, countries that don't have the means that we do can be able to attain the type of, of economic prosperity that everyone would deserve. OK, so here we are. That's not an Air Jordan 3. It's not a Nike Dunk Low Pro. And it's not an Adidas NMD R1. Those shoes cost several hundred dollars. This is a rendition of what I grew up with as a youngster. They're called PF Flyers. And we were told as kids with the advertising slogan they had, was you wear these, you could run faster and jump higher. Well, I know that there are Air Jordans out there, but this is what we have. We have in this agency the tools that we're given. And we have in this agency some remarkable people that I have often said would crawl across broken glass atop burning coals to come to work and do their job. And they do it marvelously. But we have the equipment that we have. And it's not always at the level of investment that the nation might make in other priorities. But we certainly have a priority. And it is our imperative to address that priority. We will do so with leadership. We will do so with strategy. And we will bring along the tools necessary and the people necessary, whether it's the next generation, the current generation, or two generations yet to come. We'll set the route. We'll sow the seeds. And we'll execute the route, whether we're wearing PF flyers or whether we're wearing Air Jordans. We will do the best that we can. I'd like to share with you now, in closing, just a few of what I would consider to be the maxims and precepts that have really helped me throughout my career and gotten me to a point where a kid growing up on a dirty river in New Jersey could one day be not just a deckhand on a ship, but a ship's captain, and then ultimately very proudly fulfill the responsibilities that I have been given to represent the United States in those multiple international fora. So number one. For a leadership maxim, do what's right. Don't overthink it. And rely on the sense of reasonableness and common sense that got you as far as you've gotten into your career. As you move up, the decision making is really no different. Smart people continue to perform wisely. And if you overthink it, you're going to outdo yourself. Number two, support your people. It's not about you. It's about your people. And I tell the people that I have the responsibility for that with great pride, I wear your jersey. I'm your fan. I've got your number on my chest and your color. I wear your jersey. I'm proud of you. Reflect that and show that. Number three, avoid micromanagement. Trust your people. Twofold, if you find yourself micromanaging, get some attention, get some help, readjust your metrics. If you're working for someone who's a micromanager, migrate. Micromanagement can be the most oppressive and, and imaginative, uh, destroying environment. Avoid micromanagement. Number four, life is a team sport. Engage it and play hard. It takes a team, not any one single player. Not the quarterback, not the offensive lineman, everyone. Number five, choose mentors wisely and don't be embarrassed. Let them choose you. Engage mentors, establish a network, do so wisely, and listen to them. You can learn from mentors who might recommend doing something differently than you might do, and you may choose not to take their advice. 
but it's that diversity of options that you need to enjoy by a rich body of mentors. Number six, including a rich body of, of information, establish a network. Explore professional societies. Meet people who are outside your domain. You will be enriched by it greatly. Number seven, volunteer. Get engaged. Be that person who people know to go to in order to get things done because of a volunteering spirit. Take on leadership roles. Practice your craft of leadership as you get there. Number eight and nine, these are linked. And I go back to the ocean exploration program. I go back to generating enthusiasm for mapping the world's ocean. I go back to many of the things that I talked about here on the technical side. Have a vision. Have a strategy. And brick by brick, place those in a foundational wall upon which you build your house. Everything that you do should be capable of supporting when the opportunity arises to meet that imperative to act that you've set a foundation and built a platform on top of it to launch from in order to get these objectives done. Never lose sight of your goals. So number nine, build constituency for your ideas, for your vision, and for your people. Most important, you're not building a constituency for you. You're building a constituency for the vision and the people. Number 10, understand your own ethics and limits. You can be pushed to a point where you could say, I can no longer contend with this to be responsible to my own values. Pick your battles and dig in when you're right, when you need to. It's not necessary to do it every time. Do it when it's really, really compelling. Number 11, I feel strongly about this. Never, never tolerate a bully. Bullies are damaging to your organization. They are not pursuing your best interest. Never tolerate a bully. And lastly, to conclude, leaders lead. And people can lead from every level of an organization. You do not have to have a title that says leader. I know some of the finest leaders that are working at a very modest level of elevation inside of our great agency. And they do a marvelous job. And without them, we would not be capable of attaining the goals and objectives that I've outlined to you. So I will conclude there with my gratitude and say thank you very much for your time, your attention, and giving us your, your um, best thoughts that I hope to see in some of the questions. So I will move on here and ask you to enter your questions in the Q&A box, and I'd be happy to answer them. And Claire Montgomery, who is an important part of helping to make this presentation, along with Jim Jenkins and Tiffany Atkinson, my Sea Grant fellow, I turn over to you so that you can field those questions and let me know what you would like me to ask. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Claire. All right. Thank you, everyone. There's been a number of questions coming through, so we'll go through those right now. We have about 15 minutes, and I just wanted to acknowledge if we don't get to your question during the Q&A period, we will have all of these um, in an email, uh, follow up with you via email after the session ends. OK. So the first question for Craig is, Acknowledging that we are approaching hurricane season, can NOAA influence construction in areas that are repeatedly impacted by destructive weather? For example, code requirements in Florida new house construction or safety enhancements in tornado prone areas. Thank you. NOAA does not have the ability to take control over what people, to, people do. But what we, one of the reasons why I think NOAA has such credibility is we don't prescribe a particular outcome. We provide the science-based information and turn that over to homeowners. We turn that over to insurance companies. We make that information public. All of our information is public. So when we make determinations as to where a greater or lesser frequency of storm impact has been, it's not always a forecast proposition because, as I say, the, the world tomorrow will look different than the world today. But NOAA will provide that information for people to use and make their own decisions. The people who are making those decisions today are insurance companies, reinsurance companies, bond makers, and the like. And in terms of construction prescriptions, the NIST folks, the National Institute of Science and Technology, our colleagues from the Department of Commerce, NIST engages in tests to determine what construction methodologies are most appropriate to protect, proof, uh, to protect property so that, for example, a roof in, in a high incidence of hurricane area won't blow off up to certain miles an hour if you use particular technologies that are being developed. 
We also can communicate this information through the Sea Grant Program, which is established in every coastal state and jurisdiction that the United States has. The Sea Grant folks are very important for conveying this information, but we don't control it. We provide the information, then it's up to the citizen or the other components of society to use that information, including legislators. Okay, next question is how can I become a citizen scientist? Can NOAA establish local community groups or grassroots groups to facilitate the organization of citizen scientists with a passion for contributing? To Absolutely. Depending upon where people live and what the closest point of no engagement might be, we I'll just give two examples. We range in citizen science from a handheld cell phone application where people can report the weather that they are experiencing, and that helps us verify our forecasts. And the alternative is, I can think of no better example than the amazing array of our national marine sanctuaries, each of which has an outreach component and has the ability to and has programs to recruit volunteers and citizen scientists to either make observations or pitch in and help with some of the projects that take place in the sanctuaries. But most importantly, just to give you a sneak peek, our current deputy administrator, Admiral Tim Gallaudet, retired oceanographer of the United States Navy, Admiral Gallaudet is envisioning and implementing a citizen science program with greater rigor and greater support than we have had before. And our NOAA education office that is led by Louisa Koch has a very important role in helping to advance this. So in part, I'd say look around and see what you can find already because it's out in, in the domain of NOAA from atmospheres to oceans, but stand by for an even greater impact as we develop this strategy and build it out for greater citizen science. There are many people that can help us with our mission. And we're, what we're finding is all we need to do is ask. Thank you for the question. OK, next question. Some years ago, when I took a biological oceanography class, I learned the top third of the ocean was predominantly occupied by bacteria, which we had a fairly good understanding about. But the bottom two-thirds of the ocean is occupied by viruses, which we don't understand. As our oceans continue to warm, is there a concern that these unknown viruses may have impact to our economic and health and well-being? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, let me offer the remark that for the longest time, we've been studying those things that we bump into. And it's pretty hard to bump into a bacterium or a virus. So we've been studying, we, I mean the marine science community writ large, not just NOAA, but the academic community of all nations. We've been looking at largely the mega component of the marine environment, whether it's plants or animals. Every one of those plants, every one of those animals, has viruses and bacteria on them. In fact, if you select the right part of the ocean, you can find in a shot glass a density of bacteria that would be equal to a million organisms inside of that shot glass. Hard to imagine. But if you pick the right piece of ocean, you could do so. And the distinction between bacteria high, viruses low, I'm not sure that I'm familiar with that. I think that there's an equal distribution of both because they are interdependent. Actually, the, the, um, the appearance of bacteria and, and viruses and plasmids as well, which are just individual strands of DNA, they are cosmopolitan and ubiquitous throughout the ocean. We're just discovering how cosmopolitan they are. And something I find remarkable is that it was in the early 2000s that marine scientists, and it was a scientist out at Oregon State University, who discovered the most prolific bacterium in the ocean. It is cosmopolitan. And without this bacterium, marine organisms wouldn't degrade to be broken down to reintroduce the components of nutrients necessary for photosynthesis. This is a huge linchpin in the entire marine ecosystem. And we, humanity, hadn't discovered it until the early 2000s. So we're still making very principled discoveries. I think it's overbroad to characterize a, a, a spatial distribution by depth of viruses versus bacteria. They are ubiquitous. They are cosmopolitan. There's even bacteria under the seafloor deep within that the marine drilling program, the ocean drilling program, it's an international body that they have come to find that drilling deep into the earth renders bacteria that live there, not just on the surface of the seabed. Thank you. Next question. Does the US Navy contribute information to mapping the Absolutely. World's ocean? There is a database that we have loaned and extended with Google. And you can just dial up Google Earth. 
In fact, Sylvia Earle, a former chief scientist of NOAA, made the comment that Google Earth was really, I think Sylvia said Google Dirt, and I don't mean that facetiously, though Sylvia was rather teasing to uh, Mr. Schmidt, who's the principal behind Google. And he very quickly responded by building and ordering to, to have built a, an ocean component of, of Google Earth. And if you look on there, you could see that there are contributions from NOAA, from Navy, from Scripps Institute of Oceanography. There are many components that add into that global database. The Navy contributes mightily to the ocean mapping efforts where they have been working in different parts of the world than we've been able to get to. What contributions do you anticipate from NOAA omics and eDNA research? I think the contributions are infinite. If we examine how, for the past 50 years, we've been measuring the marine ecosystem, number one, to the to the caring person who offered the comment about, or the question about bacteria and, and viruses, we've not been rigorously collecting and studying the microbial world. And the microbial world has a very important role in the chemistry of the ocean and how nutrients are handled and cycled, as I indicated by a previous comment. So omics and eDNA are going to give us a window to all the components in the ocean without us having to necessarily pick one of them up in hand and count it every time. We're starting to see from some very excellent work that's taking place around the globe with omics and eDNA sampling that there can be correlations between the shed DNA that comes from any organism. You could find my DNA in the eastern shore waters of Delaware when I go on vacation to, to the beach. I will shed DNA from my body. It will be measurable and recoverable. And you could determine that a human was in that water within a certain period of time. So taking this, the, the ease of that technology, which is coming along very quickly, we're going to be able to measure the presence, absence, relative abundance, perhaps increasingly the absolute abundance, even age and growth parameters of marine populations based on the DNA that's collected in the water. That will make our, our world a whole lot better understood and much more easy to collect. And I, at one point, was asking colleagues who are very richly in, engaged in this field, what do you think is the future until we can get to a more operational tempo? And I think they've more than cut their time estimated in half based on the recent advances just in the past two years. So I'm very excited about eDNA and omics. I think it really has a role in our characterization of the marine ecosystem. And when we look at the changes in the marine ecosystem that are driven by climate impacts and climate change, we're realizing that those marine components may be looking different in the future in terms of their distribution. So what today might be Alaska fish or New England fish or scallops or lobster may tomorrow be belonging to another nation or another geographic region. There is a latitudinal migration of these, these components of the ecosystem. We can also, with omics, measure the health of the ecosystem, because we're not just looking at the food stock fish. We're also looking at the components of the ecosystem that they are dependent upon, which brings in other characterizations like the vulnerability of fish stocks to changes in pH and ocean acidification, and also the warming of the ocean. Thank you. Could you expand in the role of NOAA in the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and the Blue Economy Value Proposition? The UN Decade of Ocean Science, there's another tag to it, and I need to say the entire title. It's the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And the goal under the UN is to advance in a sustainable way developmental use of the ocean and its resources. In other words, that's the blue economy. So the link between the ocean decade and the blue economy is already made. How does NOAA have a role in it? In terms of the leadership from NOAA that's gone into those UN bodies, whether it's the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, the Food and Agriculture Organization, UN Environmental Program, UN, several of them, NOAA has had a significant involvement in establishing and advancing those bodies. And I have to say with great pride, if I look at the World Meteorological Organization, if I look at the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, if I look at the International Hydrographic Organization, one I haven't mentioned yet, where Rear Admiral Shepard Smith represents the United States, and Rear Admiral Smith is a member of NOAA's Commission Corps. If I look at these, those bodies move and respond to the energy, the incentives, and the opportunity imperative that is taken by NOAA in advancing an agenda. And typically, many people in the world have found 
and where the United States has led and advanced, the rest of the world joins in. And I think that's very much a credit to NOAA's skill in the IHO, in the WMO, and in the IOC, and for all those people who preceded me, preceded Louis Uccellini, and preceded Shep Smith. Okay. And the um, staff. Go ahead. Do we have time for one more question? I'm good. Yes, go ahead. One more question. Okay. Okay. The last question is, what type of workforce is required to achieve a cleaner, more healthy, safer, predictive, productive, and transparent? If we look at tomorrow's workforce, it's going to look different than today's. Many of the roots of the skills that we have today will be found tomorrow, but I think we're going to be relying more on, in fact, if there were young people listening, it's not the scuba diver that we're going to be dependent upon. It's going to be the scientist, the electrical engineer, the, the computational engineer, computer engineer, that's going to be able to translate some of the observations and skills into the tools that we're going to use in the future. So I think what will change from where we are today to where we're going tomorrow is something that we have studied pretty carefully. We conducted an OAR, Oceans and Atmospheric Research Futures exercise over the past two years, and we came to conclude that obviously the future is going to look differently. But as we see people retire today, we're not replacing those people with folk who do the exact same thing. We're replacing those people with folk who are going to be able to carry us into the future, who are more integrated in their preparation. They are cross-disciplinary. They are multiple disciplinary. We will be involving social science far more than we do today because scientific understanding is good, but being able to convey that understanding to the public is really where the mission is accomplished, whether it's a weather forecast or whether an ocean condition. Public policy makers and citizens need to know how to use that information. So yes, this workforce will look quite a bit different. And with the UN Decade of Ocean Science, which was very much inspired by initiatives that root back into several countries, but the United States is proud to be among them. This is going to be a leveraging opportunity to make oceans very visible, to have the world paying attention for a decade on the oceans. And I dearly hope that as we start to recover from this COVID-19 impact and insult to the many people, and since we have, I'm looking at the numbers, we have 438 people listening here. I'm sure some of this 438 have been impacted greatly by this, and my heart goes to you, and, and my ambition goes to every one of you, that we could hope to come out of this economic impact and medical impact with a much better blue economy that really helps the United States and the nations of the world rebound from this in a healthy and sustainable way. Thank you all very much for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, um, thanks for joining us today. Our next seminar in the No Environmental Leadership Series will be on Thursday, May 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and it's titled Creating One NOAA by Lucy, Luisa Koch, NOAA's Director of Education. I want to thank everybody for your attention, and I hope to join us for our next seminar. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you all.